thank you all for uh, being here today. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of uh, President Trump. And I think I speak for all of us when I say how blessed we are to have a leader like President Trump who doesn't back down. And you never have to wonder about what he's thinking. You know, as we gather this Constitution Day to reflect on our shared heritage, I'm reminded of a speech that Abraham Lincoln gave when he was a young man back in 1838 while reflecting on some of the same mob violence that we're seeing today. And he said, quote, all the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth in their military chest, with a Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a trek on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. The biggest danger we face, the young Lincoln went on to say, would not come from abroad. It would spring up from within. He said, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Today, America is facing a coordinated attack on her history, her institutions, and her heroes. Every sin from our past is highlighted and every triumph is buried. Some individuals seem only interested in burning down our country and dividing us on the basis of race, gender, class, faith, or numerous other variables. But that very history, as our forefathers understood, is what shapes our society's identity, and our identity is the spring from which we form our beliefs. By destroying those things, you create a blank slate from which to start anew, which is what some people want to do. What these individuals fail to realize is that as Americans, the things we share in common far outweigh our differences. We must keep in mind what unites us while resisting those voices which seek to destroy us. In order to prevail over our woes, we must seek a united resolution, not a Democrat resolution or a Republican resolution, but an American solution. This Constitution Day, we once again turn to the wisdom of the past to guide us in the present. And we continually draw upon the great figures of our history to elevate our minds, ennoble our souls, and inspire our deeds today. We are indeed fortunate to live in this nation, the destination country for so many others, the only place where people form caravans trying to get in here, not trying to get out. But we, the American people, in order to save this country, must recognize that we are not each other's enemies. And we must be weary of those who wish to fundamentally change us. We must always remember that our history is what gives us our identity. And our identity is upon which our beliefs are built. And if you destroy those things, you make it very easy to deceive people. We're not perfect, we don't have a perfect history, but wise people learn from the past. Unwise people try to bury the past. We get to decide which one we wanna be. So thank you again everyone for gathering here today to bring at attention to the history of this great American experiment. And thank you for all you do for our country and her people. Thank you, Dr. Carson. What a splendid man he is. Uh, my name is Larry Arn. I'm to moderate this panel. I work at Hillsdale College. Uh, this is a panel on uh, the recovery of the history of our country, which is being distorted as an act of policy. And uh, we have here several experts who know about the distortion and who know about the history. And we will proceed roughly from people talking about those distortions and other people talking about how to correct them and correct the history. Uh, I will say that it's, uh, America itself is at stake and freedom is at stake, 
but also humanity is at stake in this argument. Uh, I'm teaching a course this term on totalitarian novels. And in the novel 1984, which is the grimmest of them, uh, the protagonist has a job. Winston Smith is his name, and his job is to rewrite history. Every time the party changes uh, its account of something, anything, contemporary or old, every written reference to it, and every book, and every article, and every encyclopedia, and every publication is corrected, and the old version is burned, and the whole thing is reprinted anew. And there's a, there must be an enormous effort. It's the main work of the regime of 1984. So he doesn't fully understand why they do that. But he learns in the end, in one of the most remarkable scenes in literature, where he has a dialogue with his torturer, O'Brien, while he's being tortured, about what he has to believe. He says, uh, the slogan of the party, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. The specific thing he has to believe is there's no reality, and that means that he has to learn to do double think, they call it, where things he remembers never happened. Everything can be wiped out, and if you think about it, the most we know about reality, we know about the past. Because the future is not here, and the present is fleeting and hard to observe, and the past is a record. That's what gave rise to Aristotle, echoed by Thomas Aquinas, saying in one of his most famous things, this alone is denied even to God, to make what has been not to have been. If there's any reality, the past is not malleable. The way we teach history in the schools today is a product of a centralized system that begins in the, first in the elite universities and then in the schools of education, which are usually not so elite, and then down through bureaucracies that provide curriculum, and they, those start at the federal level and run down through the states. And so the view of American history is legislated and then it's uh, reflected in textbooks that are uh, the choosing of which are led by the big states. And so students don't know. Uh, here's a simple example. It's a common knowledge among young people today because all the books say it, that Thomas Jefferson was a hypocrite because he wrote the Declaration of Independence and yet he was a slaveholder. And those are true things. He did do those things. But what they're not told is that he thought himself that the Declaration of Independence condemned the institution of slavery. Uh, he himself said beautifully, and things like this many times, but the most beautiful was, in the contest between the master and the slave, the Almighty has no attribute that can side with us. I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. Uh, I live in Michigan, which is part of the Northwest Territory, which is the first land added to the American Union. And that land came from Virginia, a slave state. And the moving force behind the gift to the federal government of that claim of Virginia to the West was Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder. And in that gift of land, it was established in the Northwest Ordinance that there would never be any slavery in that part of the world. And sure enough, slavery was abolished in more than 60% 60, 60 of the Union in 40 years. So they don't, they don't learn that. And if they did learn that, it's, it's not just true that it would open the way for them to love and understand their country better, it would also l l teach them to learn and understand things. Human things are like that, right? It's never perfect, it can't be. The great Lincoln says that the Declaration supplies a standard maxim for a free society uh, ever to be striven for, never to be perfectly attained. A soul that knows that growing up knows that life is going to be hard and have ja challenges and they've got to try to do well and they won't do perfectly any better than anybody else did in the past, but they could do well. What's at stake finally is the relationship between uh, the Declaration of Independence and the constitutional forms by which the, the country is governed. The Declaration of Independence prescribes under the laws of nature and of nature's God 
And if that expression means anything, it means something eternal, or it means nothing. Uh, it prescribes a kind of government in which ultimately it rests on us. But you have to have forms and institutions to make that work. It's uh, simple if you're Hitler, he passed an enabling act and that meant whatever he says goes. But so there's a contest now for the being of the country and our understanding of reality. And I thank the White House for putting this together and, and uh, Vince Haley and the others who've worked on this. And I thank the president for his uh, keen interest in this subject, which holds a promise for the future. Now our panelists will begin with Dr. Mary Graber. Uh, she is a resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the study of Western civilization. And she's done many great things. Uh, she's written a dynamite book. I haven't read the book yet, but she's telling me about it this morning and I've heard of it many times, uh, called Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History uh, That Turned a Generation Against America. Mary, where are you, Mary? There you are. Yeah. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Since 1980, when it was first published, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States has been spreading the idea that the United States is irredeemably corrupt. This book is fake history, based on falsified evidence, misquotations with critical words left out, and plagiarized disreputable sources. Yet, a record-breaking 3 million copies have been sold. Over 100,000 educators have signed up at the Zinn Education Project, and over 300,000 follow it on social media. It is widely used in advanced placement U.S. history high school classes and in teacher education programs. It is quoted in school books. In Portland, Oregon, and surrounding areas, for several years now, a young people's history has been used in all eighth grade classrooms. Zinn claims other historians have not told the truth about the atrocities committed by Columbus on down. People reading it cry and get angry, sometimes taking to the streets. The Zinn book was the most popular book for Occupy Wall Street protesters. Awards are given to organizers of Marxist groups in Zinn's name. And the Antifa member who tried to blow up an ICE detention facility left behind a manifesto saying, read Howard Zinn, A People's History of the United States. This is not to say that every protester out there knocking down statues, burning buildings, or attacking police has been directly inspired by Zinn. But after 40 years of continuous publication, I think it's safe to say that Zinn's book has had some influence. Zinn's book is full of the ideas that are inspiring riots this year, such as, quote, systemic racism wealth inequality, and police brutality. First, Zinn writes, there is not a country in world history in which racism has been more important for so long a time as the United States. Zinn describes our founding in this way. Around 1776, certain important people in the English colonies found that by creating a nation, a symbol, a legal unity called the United States, they could take over land, profits, and political power from favorites of the British Empire. In the process, they could create a consensus of popular support for the rule of a new privileged leadership." End of quote. Zinn writes that the American quote, system of government is so corrupt, neither the Civil War nor the Civil Rights Movement did much for black Americans. Peaceful protest, civil rights laws, and voting, in Zinn's book, do not work. 
police brutality, Zinn claims, is, quote, normal and endlessly repeated in the history of the country, coming randomly but persistently out of a racism deep in the institutions, the mind of the country. Zinn writes that the system, a phrase appearing 168 times in the book, was working hard by the late 60s and early 70s to stop the political and economic advance of black Americans. This, in a nutshell, is the idea of systemic racism, that racism is built into the very fabric of our system of American institutions, and that positive change in our society cannot be realized through traditional liberal democratic measures like lawmaking, voting, or even peaceable assembly. The logic follows. The American system must be overthrown. That is what we are seeing in Portland, Rochester, Minneapolis, and cities across the USA. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Brilliant. Uh, Peter Wood is the president of the National Association of Scholars. He's an anthropologist and he's former provost of the King's College. There are two formers from there here today. He was a tenured member of the anthropology department at Boston University. He is the author of many books, including Diversity, the Invention of a Concept, which won the Caldwell Award for Leadership in Higher Education from the John Locke Foundation. Uh, he's Super guy. Where, where are you, Peter? Where are we sitting? Yeah, right here. Go, Peter. Well, the radicalization that we see in the streets of American cities and the radicalization of American college students look like two separate things. The first involves protests that often escalate into vandalism, looting, burning, attacks on police, and murder. The second involves protests that focus on shutting down the free expression of ideas, though these sometimes also devolve into vandalism and personal violence. So street protests and campus protests outwardly differ. But behind that appearance lie three important connections. First is the people, the activists, who show up in both places. The second, the ideology that is crafted on campus and exported to the streets particularly hatred of America and contempt for law. And third, the anger, that fiery emotion that is ignited on campus and intensified by the mob in the streets. When we put the street side elements together, activists trained as provocateurs, harboring a radical ideology, worked up into explosive anger, alienated from our cultural norms and primed for lawlessness, we have the ingredients of a full-blown riot of the sort that has wreaked a path of destruction from lower Manhattan to Kenosha to the federal courthouse in Portland. Many of these riots appear to be planned, organized, staffed, and scheduled, often on a nightly basis for weeks on end. These are not, or at least they are not generally, spontaneous uprisings, but staged events managed by well-trained experts. They are made to look like impulsive outbursts of passion, but they run according to a well-rehearsed script. Who writes that script? The answer is fairly evident. It is the campus activists, some faculty as well as students, who have spent years immersed in anti-liberal ideology, identitarian indignation, and the study of Maoist tactics. They've been taught that gaining power by any means necessary is the legitimate path to what they think of as social justice, and they are eager to put what they've learned into practice. Only a fairly small minority of college students are converted to this whole package of radicalization, but these truly radicalized students are the organized managerial staff of the riots. Often they travel city to city, bringing their battle-tested riot planning with them and tying in with the local networks of Antifa and BLM. How complicit are colleges in this? 
A handful of professors teach outrageous courses and tweet appalling messages, but colleges work hard to convey the impression that they keep their hands clean. People who believe that image, I'm afraid, are mistaken. My organization, the National Association of Scholars, has spent a decade documenting how higher education has become the incubator of radical alienation, from divisive student or orientations through service learning that doubles as progressive indoctrination, and above all, the courses promoting doctrines such as critical race theory that depict objective standards as the masks worn by oppressors. The old courses that taught students something meaningful about Western civilization and the American founding have simply vanished in the fire and smoke of the new Hate America First curriculum. Some students shrug all this off and move on to a productive adult life, but for too many others, it becomes a vocation. Even students who are immune to the lure of radicalism pay a price. They are deprived of the education they deserve, an education that teaches a full understanding of how our self-governing, prosperous, and free society came to be and what we must do to sustain it for the generations to come. This is a loss for those students and for our country because if there's one thing that history teaches, it is that civilization does not simply endure on its own. Neglected or attacked outright, our civilization could quickly disappear. It is disappearing, and if we do nothing to stop it, it will disappear soon. The current wave of protest grew from the decades of efforts by the radical left to turn our colleges and universities into incubators of profound dissatisfaction with the American way of life. Colleges learned to package this disdain for America behind the beguiling rhetoric of diversity. But in too many cases, they left their graduates a legacy of cynical contempt for their own civilization, and in some cases, a proud delight in destruction for its own sake. Higher education shuns this verdict and sees itself as part of a noble enterprise of promoting positive systemic change. Those of us who cherish Western civilization need to hold higher education accountable for the systemic change it has actually accomplished in the form of the misguided people in the streets, some of whom have an Ivy League diploma in one hand and a Molotov cocktail in the other. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Alan Gelso is one of the top historians of the Civil War ever. He has a PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania. He's a senior research scholar in the Council of Humanities at Princeton University, where he directs an initiative on statesmanship and politics in the James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions. He's a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute and a visiting fellow of the Heritage Foundation and its Fulner Institute. He's written some great books, and I've read all of them but one. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America, and uh, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion. And all of those have won the Lincoln Prize, because who else would you give it to? <laughs> Alan Gilso. The story of most human societies has followed a more or less predictable pattern. It is the pattern of tribes, sometimes of tribes establishing control over others by war or subversion, or of tribes breaking free of that control, and in both cases led by a charismatic leader whose reward is godlike power over all. These tribes identify themselves by language or ethnicity or soil, but their story is mostly the same. Us, not them. Power, not liberty. Stasis, not transformation. 244 years ago, from the intellectual milieu of the 18th century enlightenment, one nation broke with this pattern, identifying itself by the natural and inalienable rights of all men, 
has received not from some legendary leader, but from the almighty creator himself. Eleven years later, this nation wrote a Republican instrument of government that turned all its attention to how those rights could best be secured. In a world of empires and monarchs and serfs, where men were born as an atom of dust and women as a straw in the wind, the American Republic would bid the atom of dust become a man, the straw in the wind a woman. And both were set free to make of themselves whatever they wished or dreamed or struggled to be. Yet this new republic has had its enemies. First, the monarchs, who were amused and then alarmed by it. Then the romantic ideologues, who found replacements for the comforting embrace of tribe in the lethal embrace of race and class. Through these challenges, our best protection has come through our history through the remembrance of a great soldier who laid down his commission rather than seize power, of a shrewd lawyer whose hand freed slaves and wiped out the Republic's ugliest birthmark, of an enslaved man who lived to be the greatest example and the greatest preacher of self-made men, of an actor who bade the walls of tyrants come tumbling down. In truth, history has been our only protection, for we have no ethnicity, no tribe to fall back upon. Only our vivid dedication to an enlightenment ideal, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone. But our history is not in good health. Sometimes its illness is one of neglect. In our anxiety for dominance in science and technology, history has been nudged aside, so that in 2014, the National Assessment of Educational Progress showed that only 18% of American eighth graders could be considered proficient in US history, while fully one-third do not know when the Civil War occurred and 40% could not identify the words of the Gettysburg Address with Abraham Lincoln. Sometimes, however, our history's eclipse has had more malign sources in those whose ideology leads them to cast the American experiment in as grim a shade as possible so that the way can be made over the ruins of the Republic for some imagined new order which, in the end, turns out to be only a new tribalism. Pick up the newest issues of our flagship historical quarterlies, and their contents will often be an unrelieved witch's Sabbath of condemnation of the American past and the improbability of an American future, of a revolution concocted to defend slavery, of capitalism which is coterminous with bondage and with truth at the mercy of narrative, and never a thought to whether this will build up rather than tear down the souls of its readers. The ideologues are not unwise in crafting a strategy which tells us that our history is a balloon sent aloft to decoy us from the tracks of the powerful. If we wish to imperil the American experiment, we can find few more sinister paths to that peril than by forgetting, obscuring, or demeaning who we were. For that will tell the story of who we are and who we will become. History is not merely a trot line of metaphors to be analyzed purely as a construct of language. It is not a novel it is about specific people in specific places within specific events, and to treat it otherwise is to entertain nonsense and to invite the production of despair and discouragement. But our energies cannot be consumed in merely pulling down the pullers down. Fellow citizens, 
said Abraham Lincoln in 1862, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. We must think anew and act anew, and then we shall save our country. Like Nehemiah of old, we must weep for the memory of a city in ruins, but we must also be those who say, as in Nehemiah's time, let us rise up and build again. Thank you, Alan. I should have said that Alan is also an actor who never went into that line of work. <laughs> Uh, Victoria Spiotto is a prodigy. She's a student and future teacher from Northern Virginia. She's fini f finishing her fifth year at the University of Virginia. Uh, she has a bachelor's in French government and she's getting a master's in teaching. At school, she leads the Young Americans Freedom Chapter. We have one of those at Hillsdale, and that may be the only place they don't cause trouble. She's also a polyglot who focuses her studies on elementary teaching and language immersion experiences abroad. Victoria. My name is Victoria Spiato, and I am a student at the University of Virginia. I love and appreciate my university, which is part of the problem, but also potentially part of the solution that I would like to discuss here today. The University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson, a man who was notable for his steadfast belief in individualism, natural freedom, and the full and free use of human intellect in the search for truth. Jefferson helped lay the foundation for a government under which every American could pursue happiness as a freely choosing individual. He founded an academic institution with the goal of fostering a community of lifelong learners, people who inquire about the world in search of truth. He hoped that UVA would strengthen this country by being a part of teaching its citizens the lessons of history. Most of all, Jefferson wanted Americans to study the history of liberty and how freedom can sometimes be pushed aside by tyranny. Jefferson's university still lives and fosters innovation and progress to this day. However, some of this academic progress we see in American academia and student culture today is rather regressive. Instead of freely exploring different points of view, which is what college is supposed to encourage, honest debate is sometimes shut down. Labels given for being on the wrong side are based on the simplistic binary of being good or bad as a person. This is harmful because it shrinks the marketplace of ideas on campus and it leaves little space for ideological nuance. In too many American universities today, administrators do not stand up to students who try to silence those with whom they disagree. In some courses, students rarely get a chance to even hear or consider the other side due to things like bias, syllabi, or agenda-driven professors. In a liberal education, all ideas should be studied, presented, and fairly debated. What's more, the new norm of rewriting or reframing history that now permeates into scores of campus cultures may play a role in endangering the very foundation upon which my university and our country stands, the legacy of the Founding Fathers. While embraced forms of critical theory suggest that it is best to view the world through the paradigm of power and physical characteristics, I believe and stand by the fact that truth stands alone and that we must not surrender our search for it. I do not believe that the principles of liberty and equality written by Thomas Jefferson into the Declaration of Independence are just lies used by the powerful to manipulate the public. Yet that is what critical theory teaches. But truth is not just a trick of the power. In fact, it is the foundation for American prosperity. We should not manipulate truth and history in order to superficially cater to a subjective and often offensive idea of diversity, which views people as only labels and sacrifices the natural individuality within those manufactured groups. As I've been studying and preparing to be a school teacher, I've encouraged various uh, I've encountered various ways in which the critical theory wrongly finds its place within the field of teacher education. Many academic institutions plant these ideas and professors and their students water and nourish them unchallenged. Critical theory stands against our founding principles and above all the place of equal individual liberty in our society. I do not believe that students should be treated differently because they fit in certain categories. I believe that students are empowered through their inherent value as creations of God. Universities like to portray and define what it means to be culturally aware in divisive ways. 
This involves manipulating language and reframing reality into something sensational. However, I think cultural awareness is best found by respecting, honoring, and objectively analyzing history. It is not a question of rewriting the past in order to perfect people now. It is a question of learning from foundational thinkers like Jefferson in order to ensure that government arms like public education are built such that they do not infringe on the nature of the young human mind. Just as we all solemnly remembered 9-11 last week, we must not forget the past. By forgetting, truth gets lent to authors before it is handed to our students. The founding, even with its flaws and hypocrisies, was an incredible experiment. Valiant thinkers dared to craft a form of government that respected natural law like never before. This should be viewed through the objective lens and remembered as a part of preserving our way of life. The trends in higher education's cancel culture are dangerous. To cancel the founding fathers for being hypocritical is to cancel the very ideas which lie at the basis of civility and individual liberty. The effort to delegitimize the minds and the people which crafted our founding documents is the first step in delegitimizing those very documents and therefore the founding principles. Canceling our history is not justice. It is in fact allowing those of influence or power to redesign justice. Principles like justice, fairness, and truth are principles that should not be redefined and packaged in critical theory's wrapping paper. This rewrapping seeks to foster disdain for the virtues and pillars that allow people to reach their individual potential without needing the government. The Constitution empowers us, especially us young students, to build our own destinies. By rewarding our founding documents, re by regarding our founding documents as sacred, we are inevitably recognizing that we as individuals are of value as well. My university's founder took it upon himself to courageously contribute to a world-changing project. By the same token, why shouldn't young Americans do the same by committing to historical integrity and objective truth at a time when that history is being wrongly reframed? Where the new woke campus culture claims to be unbiased and in support of an objective, non-discriminatory worldview, it actually creates the most selective and prejudiced system of them all, that of concentrated power. When it determines that everything is a question of power, they will use that power to silence others and reframe the truth of our past. Anyone who has read the world history that Thomas Jefferson wanted us to study will know that this is the path to tyranny. May universities continue to be places where great ideas, as opposed to grave injustices, are born. I hope that my reflections on the direction of our colleges and universities can make a positive contribution to the broader discussion we are having here today about our beloved American history. Thank you. Prodigy indeed. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so all of the speakers here have something to say about how to fix this problem. Uh, the next four are going to talk chiefly about that because they have big things going on aimed in that direction. And the first of them is the great Bill McClay. Uh, he's the Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma, although I have inside information that he's soon to go to a fine place. <laughs> All signed up. Uh, he was uh, appointed <laughs> in 2000. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was all right. It yeah. sounded a little like Jesus. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He's not going to that finest place yet. Not yet. He's, uh, he's appointed in 2002 to the National Council on the Humanities, the advisory board for the National Endowment for the Humanities. He's uh, served as a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And then the big thing. Uh, I have no friend who hasn't been intending to write a textbook of worth about the history of America. But I only have one who's done it. And it's recent, and it's great, and it's called Land of Hope, an Invitation to the Great American Story, Bill McClay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arnon, and good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm going to talk about Abraham Lincoln, amazingly. Um, but I'm, what I want to do is tell a story about him that I think illustrates a point that, that, uh, that, uh, that we can then uh, expatiate on a little bit. We all know that Lincoln was 
a voracious reader, we, and, and he had very little formal education, got most of his uh, sense of the English language from reading Shakespeare and uh, the soaring language of the King James Bible. He read evidently almost no history in his early days. Uh, the sole exception that we know of was Mason Weems' biography written in 1799 of uh, George Washington. Uh, it's a book few would read today and certainly not for its accuracy. It is the book from which we get the fable about George Washington chopping down the cherry tree and then being unable to lie about it. Uh, the mature Lincoln went on to develop a more informed and sophisticated understanding of history, but he never forgot the Weems history. Elements of it stuck in his mind and influenced his view of the American Revolution and the Civil War and reflected his fundamental values. We know this because in February of 1861, 40 years after he read uh, Weems's book, Lincoln drew upon it in public. He was on his way from Illinois to Washington for the inauguration. It was a time of great tension in the country. Southern states were voting uh, one by one to secede from the Union in response to Lincoln's election. He stopped off in Trenton, New Jersey, on his way to Washington. And in a speech to the New Jersey State Senate, a uh, very short, wonderful speech, he recalled the effect of Weems's book on him as a young man. And he particularly remembered the Battle of Trenton. I quote, I remember all the accounts of the battlefield and struggles for the liberty of the country, and none fixed themselves on my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton, the pivotal battle. And I go on with Lincoln's language, which is much better than mine. The crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at that time, all fixed themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. I remember thinking then, boy even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for. And that something, he went on to say, was even more than national independence, something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world for all time to come. It was the perpetuation of the Union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. A close quote. What a lot for a story to do. It helped to form a vision of the American past, a vision that was both inspiring and true, a vision that sustained him through the dark days to come, the last days of his life. Note, too, that although himself a fierce opponent of slavery, Lincoln did not focus on George Washington's history as a slave owner, even though he, of course, knew of it. He did not entertain the view fashionable among Southern planters then and New York journalists now that the nation was founded on slavery. No, he insisted, it was founded on other principles entirely principles of liberty and equality and self-rule that were new in the world, as Alan Gelso has so eloquently stated. They were new in the world, principles that America was born to champion. He was right then and he is right now. So what are we to conclude from this? Do historians need to retool and start writing Mason Weems-like uh, histories? No, absolutely not. History has to be based on truth, not on myth. But we need to remember that one of the functions of history is to serve as an expression of our shared memory, imparting to each generation a sense of membership in its own society, a sense of living connection to its own past. We need that. We need that today more than ever. Uh, John Dos Passos wrote the following words in 1941, by the way, in times of change and danger when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity, 
with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present. That sense of continuity was something Lincoln could summon, something he possessed, something that strengthened him in enduring our nation's greatest trials. Our young people today deserve nothing less. We are failing them in our country so long as we fail to give them a rich and sustaining sense of their own past, a sense that's both truthful and inspiring. It's high time for that to change. Thank you, Bill. Yes, maybe in case you're wondering, the fine place is going happens to be Hillsdale College. It's a pretty good place. Um, Theodore Rebarber is the CEO of AAT, an organization that just received a grant from the NEA National Endowment for the Humanities to develop instructional units on American history organized around the book of Dr. Bill McClay. Uh, he's going to make it famous and make it used so it can be broken down to uh, be of greatest benefit to students. Uh, Mr. Rebarber has worked on education reform and policy for three decades, uh, co-founder and education officer of a charter school management company, senior staffer for a member of Congress, policy staff at the Department of Ed, research associate at the Vanderbilt Institute for Policy Studies. Theodore Rebarber. Good afternoon. I'm deeply honored to be here and participate this White House Conference on U.S. History in the presence of our founding documents. Today is Constitution Day. It is also Citizenship Day, on which we honor all those who have attained American citizenship. Given that, I will take just a moment to acknowledge two brave subjects of the East Bloc communist regime of Romania, Sergio, also known as Israel, Antonia, also known as Miriam, my parents, who left all that they knew to take their two young sons, myself and my brother, at the age of six, and legally emigrated to the United States. I am forever grateful to them. Immigrants who come to America from such places do not take this remarkable country for granted. We know it has flaws. Every country does. Yet we appreciate America and love it for its freedom, opportunity, and rule of law, its never-ending efforts to address problems and injustices, and the traditions and fundamental human decency of its people, which make it all possible. The history we teach our children cannot solve all of our problems, nor should we expect it to. But it can provide a factual foundation for discussing current challenges and seeking solutions, while educating a new generation about America's remarkable heritage and what brings us together. Unfortunately, all too often, that is not the type of history we are providing our students. Others on this panel are discussing the deeply divisive misrepresentations of the 1619 Project whose author has publicly admitted the, that accuracy was not her first priority. I will address the materials used in schools which have not formally adopted the 1619 effort, often assuming that these more mainstream instructional materials are safe and not prone to such problems. I will also describe history instructional materials that my new nonprofit organization, AAT, has begun developing to address these issues with an initial grant from the National Endowment for Humanities. In high school U.S. history, the most widely perceived gold standard is the College Board's AP U.S. History course. It often influences even non-AP U.S. History classes at the high school and even middle school levels. The AP U.S. History course framework, unfortunately, presents a distorted picture of U.S. history that is in some ways more dangerous to do its subtlety when compared to the 1619 Project. The casual reviewer is unlikely to notice what is not present. 
or patterns that only become clear when one analyzes the document as a whole. For example, the main AP US History course framework refers to property five times, of which four are in a negative context of restricting the right to vote based on property requirements. The only reference to legal protections for property rights, a more positive context, refers to the Northwest Ordinance, a relatively obscure reference to most non-historians. Nothing is included on constitutional protections for fundamental property rights, such as the prohibition on government taking a person's property without just compensation, or protections for inventions or other intellectual property. Stepping back and considering our current social context, if property has been presented to students mostly as an example of historical injustice, what does this suggest to students about the need to respect the private property of others? In the case of religion, with few exceptions, the references are vague formulations about divergent views or new beliefs. There's nothing explicit referencing the Bible or Jews or Judaism. The few references to Christianity or Christians in the framework are mostly negative, including as a cause of the conquest of the new world and participants in colonizing and exploiting native populations and Africans. But no mention is made of Christianity's history as a driving motivation behind the abolition of slavery, nor about its motivation for charitable social activity or the civil rights movement. No mention is made of the common use of biblical quotations and beliefs in political pamphlets during the revolutionary period. For example, Thomas Paine's Common Sense has an extended section discussing biblical sections and judges and Samuel. The Constitutional Convention is framed through the lens or thematic focus of an event fostered by social and political groups. While that was certainly a critical element, it leaves out the impact of brilliant individual founders, great men who could sometimes rise above merely representing the interests of different factions. The only substantive historical developments of the Constitutional Convention identified as required course content are compromises over the representation of slave states in Congress and the role of the federal government in regulating slavery and the slave trade. Similarly, the entire topic of the Constitution itself is covered in half a page. The required course content is captured by a single sentence description of the historical developments represented by the Constitution. Quite a few other topics described in the course framework receive more extensive and specific coverage than the Constitution. AAT, my organization, nonprofit, is committed to developing history instruction materials that are accurate and tell the whole story. That includes America's faults but it also includes its remarkable accomplishments. We have partnered with nationally recognized historian and fellow panel member, Bill McClay, who has authored an absolutely outstanding, readable, and overall positive US history textbook, Land of Hope, that we believe is the best available. We'll work with Bill, along with other excellent historians and educators who've identified to develop instructional units that provide teachers with detailed instructional support, presentation materials, assignments, assessments, how to handle diverse student skill levels, and everything else they might need. The units will include a strong emphasis on students engaging with core original documents, including the Constitution and Declaration, to develop a basic mastery of these works. Students will learn to analyze, discuss, write short and longer historical analyses and papers. We believe that many parents, educators, and other interested citizens share our concern about the quality of history education and want something better. We appreciate that the NEH has provided us with a grant that allows us to begin this work, but the full effort will require citizens who agree that this is an enormous need to work with us to also visit our website 
and find out more about this initiative. And that website is aateducation.org, aateducation.org. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Jackson is the director of the Institute for Classical Education, and he's the chief academic officer of a network of charter schools called Great Hearts. And I think there must be close to 30 of those now. 32. 32. Yeah, see, they're just, they're just bursting at the seams. And uh, they're a great thing. I happen to know a little about them. Uh, before he did that, he was a professor of English and education at the King's College in New York. And uh, he spent many years training future teachers, teachers in educational history and philosophy. He knows what he's doing. Uh, Dr. Robert Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Arne. It is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon on behalf of those 32 schools and more than 22,000 students. I want to speak just for a few moments about the nature of teaching American history and why it is so important. It is, in fact, a civic duty as we teach American history, one that should be undertaken with great care and a profound sense of gratitude, for it is a national story that has been entrusted to us. By faithfully transmitting that story to the young, we are giving shape to the minds and the hearts of the next generation. Consider the following examples. When an elementary-aged child hears the story of our first president's farewell address, that child learns to recognize the nature of personal integrity embodied in the life of George Washington. When a middle schooler learns that Thomas Jefferson drafted the original Declaration of Independence with a section designed to abolish slavery, though Jefferson was a slave owner, that young person learns to recognize the limitations of our most admirable founders. Or when a high schooler reads Frederick Douglass's stirring 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? That teenager learns to recognize the former slave's appeal to divine justice, an argument that critiques existing human laws by holding them accountable to a higher law. In each case, teaching our history well prepares the next generation to understand our people's virtues and limitations, to interpret American ideals in relation to the institutions and the reality of human fallibility, and to distinguish arguments that can sustain our pursuit of a more perfect union. That is what makes American history such a vital subject. On this Constitution Day 2020, surrounded by original manuscripts here in the rotunda, it is fitting for us to reflect on why we must teach American history wisely. It serves as a source of inspiration for all, but especially the young who deserve an opportunity to claim their constitutional birthright, a legacy enshrined in the Constitution and proclaimed in the Declaration, what Frederick Douglass called that glorious liberty document. It is the ongoing pursuit of liberty that makes American history such a hopeful subject. Yet for several decades, the teaching of American history has been weighed down with ideological baggage, from an academic world suffused with skepticism and devoted to debunking the errors of the past. This disconcerting trend in scholarship has also encouraged the popular press to depict history as a simplified morality tale, wherein contemporary categories are applied to historical events to expose the failings of our forebearers. While the study of history does indeed provide opportunities to learn from the past and its errors, there is something deeper, more disturbing beneath this academic orientation, which prefers theory and ideology over the discovery of truth. The conscientious study of history offers us rich veins of truth to explore our common humanity. Are we not, after all, susceptible to the same weaknesses as those we read of in the history books? Certainly, we are prone to greed, anger, and pride, that which we see in our ancestors. But we are also capable of their generosity, patience, and humility. 
In the pages of a well-written history, like that of Wilfred Maclay's Land of Hope, we discover flesh and blood people struggling with real problems, dealing with their limitations and striving to make something good out of it all. That is a better way to teach American history, for it begins with humility and continues with hard work. Carefully weighing the record, going straight to the sources, to understand how real people learn to live out their ideals. Amid the challenges, the quandaries, even the oppression of their times, if we want to learn from the annals of history, we must submit ourselves to the truth, whatever the cost, and search unfailingly for the good. Thankfully, we discover that we are not alone in the quest to produce a more just society. Surrounded by a cloud of witnesses from nearly 250 years, we are inspired by the ideals and the examples of those who've gone before us. And that is why we read the farewell of George Washington, to let grade schoolers hear the statement's final official words, that the free constitution, which is the work of your hands, may be sacredly maintained. And we read Thomas Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration letting those middle schoolers see for themselves that even the most enlightened minds may not fully perceive the moral demands of the truth. Then we read Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, letting the high schoolers experience the rhetorical powers of a great man whose words have the piercing moral clarity of a prophet's. By teaching our nation's history with such equanimity, we provide the young with the tools of thought and expression to equip them for active citizenship. We teach them to accurately read the record for themselves. We teach them to interpret impartially the mixture of problems, purposes, and motives from the past. And we teach them to understand that our present moment is informed by and built upon the accomplishments of our predecessors. Like the Great Arts Academies, which I represent, K-12 classical schools across the country consider the teaching of history to be the backdrop for the entire liberal arts curriculum, a product of the collective wisdom of the ages. Poets, scientists, statesmen, and mathematicians joins historians in a great conversation that continues down to the present. By engaging with the prudent voices from our past, students come to more fully understand the human experience in all of its variety across time. Ultimately, the history we recount gives shape to the lives we lead. And for Americans, our nation's past provides the inspiration and the ideals to continue that quest for liberty, which is our constitutional birthright. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, our final speaker is Jordan Adams. After that, we'll have a few minutes for discussion. Uh, Jordan is a graduate of Hillsdale College, which means I think of him as being 18 years old. But uh, he's grown into a man, and I feel old. Uh, he's the Associate Director of Instructional Resources at Hillsdale College, and has served as a high school history teacher and director of the history program for our public charter school network at Hillsdale College. And he's a bright boy, though maybe not as smart as his wife, uh, Jordan Adams. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. My name is Jordan Adams. Uh, I have taught history and government to middle and high school students for several years, and now I work for Hillsdale College training and advising history teachers in public schools that Hillsdale supports across the country. Uh, as part of my job, I have been privileged to observe history teachers at work in hundreds of classrooms. My own experience as a history teacher and my time observing and advising so many other history teachers has deepened my understanding of what makes for a great history curriculum and for great history instruction. What I have learned above all is that mediocre teaching is easy, but great teaching is one of the toughest jobs in America. Teaching is a labor of love, and great teachers have a love for two things. First, their students, and second, their subject matter. Because they desire the good for both their students and their nation,
great history teachers work tirelessly to share their love of American history with their students. Many of today's young Americans have never encountered this love for America's story. Cynical, deconstructionist, cherry-picking histories, such as those of Howard Zinn and the magazine articles of the 1619 Project, have neither love for America's story nor its students uppermost in mind. Instead, they pursue absurdly simplistic explanations, like class struggle and systemic racism. Such concepts blind them to the fuller truths of America's history, the richer realities of our past, and they use these simplistic theories as tools to tear down their country, manipulate their students, or both. Nor do these historians love their students in a way that truly serves them. They do not respect their students' independence as free thinkers who are capable of grappling with the complexity of historical reality and forming their own judgments about it. They do not respect the inherent human dignity of each student, just as they do not see the dignity and humanity, the mixture of good and bad that America's heroes and all great historical figures have possessed. Instead, they rob their students of their heritage of their birthright, of their ability to understand accurately the origins of the world in which they live. In a sense, these skeptical historians rob students of their inheritance. They rob them of heroes to honor and be inspired by, from whose mistakes they might learn. They deprive their students of the joy of learning in a dynamic, honest, and imaginatively rich classroom. They rob their students of profound opportunities to learn from previous generations the path to maturity and happiness. Nearly two years ago, I came across a review copy of Bill McClay's Land of Hope. Taking it in after having read parts of dozens of other histories was like hearing an instrument suddenly come into tune. What I found in Land of Hope was the same thing I had seen transform students' lives in successful history classes, a love of country and of the students themselves. Land of Hope strikes a chord, and that chord blends the complex truths of America's history with the most inspiring way of teaching. To begin with, Land of Hope tells a story, which is the etymology of the word history. While most textbooks strike readers as tiresome encyclopedias that drain the drama out of history, McClay's work conveys an actual story. Land of Hope is something like a compelling personal biography of an entire nation. It captures students' imaginations and transports them to another time and place. McClay respects the dignity of the student. He does not pander, withhold, skew, or otherwise seek to manipulate the student's understanding. Instead, he presents a truthful story in its fullness and intricacies, then asks his readers to reflect on it. He feeds the students hunger for knowledge with full lives of real people. He doesn't grab attention solely with scandal and outrage as Zinn or 1619 might do. That is the easy way out, a way that kills off a student's natural sense of wonder and more often than not turns molehills into mountains. Finally, Dr. McClay conveys respect for those who came before us, those who shaped the world into which we and our students have been born. He knows that no one is perfect just as no one is without some measure of goodness. He presents America's heroes as they were and asks students to judge them based on the totality of their words and deeds rather than the scandalous few. McClay wants students to applaud and preserve what is good in our history and our heroes. Yet he also bids us condemn the bad while learning from the ways in which our country and its heroes have fallen short. It is, of course, imperative that students come to understand what makes America exceptional. There is no precedent in the history of humankind for a nation founded on ideas, ideas of individual liberty, equality, and a capacity for self-government. There is no precedent for a people working, fighting, and dying to prove the truths 
of those ideas. That a nation built around these ideas should become the freest and most prosperous nation ever to have existed is no accident and is never more than a single generation of corrupted education away from extinction. America's founders rightly reminded us that the ultimate determinant of our success as a nation would be our ability to sustain a virtuous and well-educated citizenry. The dangerous state of American history education today is about to prove our founders right yet again. Restoring the true teaching of American history would give our young people and our nation a fighting chance to turn the tide, preserving their American inheritance for another generation. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes for some discussion. We have a hard stop because some important person is going to come here next. And uh, I'd like to begin by saying, Dr. Carson, would you like to say anything, having heard all that? Well, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to thank fellow panelists uh, for some very provocative uh, thoughts. Uh, sometimes you feel like a, a voice crying in the wilderness alone, but the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people here who are thinking about and observing the things that are going on. Uh, in our country. And uh, it's very appropriate that we're here in this building that contains the Constitution of the United States. And uh, I believe that that's a divinely inspired document and uh, something that really uh, need not be tampered with it has allowed us uh, to ascend from a bunch of ragtag militiamen uh, to the most powerful empire in the world. Uh, in a record period of time. But part of the, the way that our nation was put together uh, was recognizing what the important foundational elements were. There is only one business that is protected by our Constitution, and that is the media. And there's a reason that the media was protected. It's because they were supposed to be honest brokers of the truth and disseminate information to the people because the country was supposed to be run on the will of the people, not become a government-centric area. We're going to have to stop and think, was that the right pathway? There are many who think that it wasn't and that, in fact, we should be government-centric. And uh, there are many who have tried that in the past. It has not worked. And it's going to require incredible courage at this stage of the game. People must be willing to stand up for what they believe in. We have to realize that we are being, as a society, manipulated by people who have an agenda. And you can't fight people with agenda unless you have one also, unless you have a plan and unless you understand them, unless you understand that in our colleges and universities and even on the streets, there are those who are bent on convincing certain segments of our population that they are victims and that someone is causing all the problems in their lives and that there will be no justice until you're able to destroy those people. And then another group, you want to convince them that they should be guilty because they and their ancestors are responsible for all the bad things that have happened to others. And let me tell you, that is a terrible combination, victimhood and guilt. The decisions that arise from that are abominable, and we're seeing them now. So we clearly have to understand what is happening and begin to fashion a response that is easy for people to understand. I think that is our mission. I think the panelists deserve a round of applause. So I have a few questions for you. Um, Peter, are there, 
You talked about a lot of terrible trends. Are there good trends in the, in the academy? They're hard to spot. <laughs> uh, we've heard of some of them here today. I'm heartened by the rise of charter schools and classical academies that are uh, bringing real history to tens of thousands, if not millions, of American uh, students. I'm heartened by Bill McClay's textbook and the uh, good reception that ha has come for it. Uh, uh, in a strange way, I'm heartened by the financial challenges that now face much of American higher education, which has grown complacent in its uh, progressive orthodoxy over uh, the last 50 years or so, and now may have to rethink where uh, they can find students willing to pay high tuitions to attend schools of indoctrination. That just might persuade them to take another look at what they're actually teaching and how they're teaching it. Uh, uh, it's true that I spent my few minutes talking about some of the dire circumstances of uh, the uh, situation that faces our cities, our country as a whole, and its connection to education. Uh, but from where I sit in my job as the head of a reform-minded organization, the American people seem to be awakening to this problem as never before. Uh, the fact that we are uh, called here to Washington to talk about this is something new. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. This is an extraordinary event that this panel is occurring because up until just the last few months, there has been so little sense in this country that education is anything but a utilitarian good, that, uh, that as long as it's producing people who can go out and get jobs, it's doing its rightful work. And that whole aspect of education that produces enlightened minds and patriots and people who care about how best to govern the country has been a very diminished chord of our national conversation until now, and I'm heartened by that. Thank you. Alan, you're going to write some more great books, and are others that you know of going to do it? <laughs> well, is that a question or a statement? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a, that, that was a command, but you can comment on it if you want to. <laughs> well, there are many subjects that fall within the range of the study of American history. I mean, in a real sense, everything which happened until just about right this moment is a fit subject for the study of American history. I think there are some encouraging developments in the writings, uh, the writing of some significant works, not the least of which is Bill's Land of Hope. I see it also in some other places, in, curiously enough, some movies. One doesn't often look to the movies for getting particularly reliable history, and yet, there have been some very encouraging ones. I think of the 2012 Spielberg Lincoln. And there was a movie which was an affirmation, not only of Lincoln, but of the entire process of democratic deliberation moving towards the abolition of slavery. So there are these indications, and yet on the ground, the overall picture is not an encouraging one. If it were, I wouldn't be here today. We deal and have to deal with history education at the level of K through 12 schools. And there the battle is often won over school boards and the people who are able to make deals with the school boards. The Zinn Project is an example of this. But the, the great success of the Zinn Project really has very little to do with Howard Zinn being a compelling historian, much less a compelling writer. But it has a great deal to do with the way his material has been packaged, developed, sold, and in many respects snuck under the door, not only of unsuspecting parents, but in many cases unsuspecting teachers. There has to be some reflection now on how we are administering education, on what is going into the substance of that, 
how it's happening at K through 12, how it's happening in graduate schools, and how it is happening in our colleges and universities. There are ways to deal with this. Most of them are going to be indirect, but then again, indirection was how the problem began in the first place. So there are good indications, but the situation is a serious one and not by any stretch of the imagination to be underestimated, one to be addressed at a variety of levels, at the federal level, at the state level, at the municipal level, and at the level of each one of us who have families and children. In Henry V, in that great speech that Shakespeare puts into the mouth of King Henry V, he speaks about those who remember what happened on St. Crispin's Day. We often fail to notice this key line, this story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day until the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. Note that. The good man will teach his son. The good parent will teach their children. If we begin there, then the work of renewal, I think, will spread outwards like ripples in the pond. Pretty. Um, so there are two, there's policy issues at stake here in the, what we've talked about on this panel. And there are two lines of approach that have been on both sides of the aisle in politics. And one line is centralize the standards and the other line is decentralize the administration of the schools. And the greatest example of that, the most successful, is charter schools. Uh, Robert Jackson, why are those better? And what's the future for them? Well, I believe that the benefit of charter schools is that a community orients around a common understanding of the education they wish to provide for their children. And while the state makes this arrangement with the charter governing board, there's room or there's freedom to organize around a curricular and a pedagogical set of principles. So the schools that I represent uh, are a part of something that's much larger. There are more than 200 charter schools that identify themselves as classical. And of course, there are thousands of charter schools nationwide whose arrangement with the state, whose contract, provides, again, the freedom to identify the essential content and the pedagogy that that community has determined is best for their children. As I look at the policy landscape, we need more of that freedom and the families that are coming to schools like ours are exercising their right. They're exercising, of course, their, their choice uh, to have the type of education that they desire for their children. And I think that families and something of a grassroots movement is now emerging to show that the status quo we've been describing here uh, in this conference is no longer satisfactory. And given some of the, the movement uh, that we're seeing around classical and within the charter sector more broadly, I think it's very important for us to be able to make a case, just as been, has been described here at the table, uh, for alternatives, specifically alternatives that recover both a, a true and equanimous a reading of history, a real balanced sense of history, uh, but even more broadly than that, a full exposition of liberal arts education that has in many ways been sidelined by the ideological uh, trends that we've described here. Thank, thank you. Uh, so we have one more. Uh, sorry, Victoria, I'm commanded not. <laughs> the, um, so that same point is latent in this. Well, you write a textbook for high schools in America for the public schools is you go through an enormous process with a big publisher and there are a thousand requirements and every line has to be subjected to them and they change all the time. How'd you write your book, Bill? I didn't do any of that. Uh, and I really owe that, to, uh, that, that privilege, that uh, freedom to, uh, to uh, my publisher, uh, Encounter Books, uh, run by Roger Kimball. Uh, and uh, he just uh, sort of turned me loose. I wrote a, a fairly brief proposal with a chapter outline. And, uh, 
and he turned me loose. I, I took a little longer than he would have liked for, to, to produce it, but he uh, just periodically checked in on me, how you doing? I did not have to run, run the text through any committees, any interest groups, any stakeholders or stake bearers. Uh, 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 it, it was uh, just me up in my attic every night uh, tapping it out. Uh, I didn't have a research assistant. I didn't take a leave of absence. I, uh, I, it was just something I, I did because uh, I felt passionately that, that, that such a book should exist. And uh, I didn't know whether I was the one to do it, but just sometimes you have to, uh, it falls to you because nobody else is doing it. So I, that's, that's, uh, that's why I did it. But I, the freedom that you're describing uh, stems from the willingness of this publisher. Uh, I mean, a number of people asked me, why did you publish with Norton or you know one of the other? And I said, because the book that would have come out would not have been my book. It would have been a, 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 a product. It would have been like something written by a committee, which frankly is what most te textbooks are. You see on the cover a list of very distinguished names, um, which may have had some role in the writing of the textbook, uh, maybe not much, um, but it, it, uh, the, the book that comes out reflects this sausage making process that uh, Dr. Arn has described. Uh, and uh, I just did it the old fashioned way, just one person. Uh, and it reflects, you will definitely, when you read it, as I trust you all will do, <laughs> uh, uh, You'll, you'll sense that, that there is an author, there's a person behind this. And I think that is a much better way to relate history than to kind of give the impression that history is the, you know, the voice of God or the voice of some kind of objectivity beyond the, the peculiarities and idiosyncrasies of an individual person. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, we, we have to have Several allusions have been made to cancel culture. Victoria said some things about it. Uh, uh, I think it's very important that we have institutions and publishers that are willing to, to publish things that might encounter some, I haven't encountered a lot of trouble, but, or any trouble really, but, I, that, but uh, that's gonna be very important. Have those venues, have those institutions out there functioning. Thank you. So I, we're out of time, I'm actually gonna bring it to a close three minutes before I'm told I had to because uh, they're nervous back there but uh, I'll just say this to close education is what we have to say to the future it's uh, what we believe when we tell our young and right now is a time for choosing there have been times when when the main political forces in both parties were friendly to education reform and decentralization this is not such a time so we have some big decisions to make in the next few weeks. Thank you all for being here and thank the panelists.